So if someone privately funded a statue of Edward Snowden giving the finger to this to the NSA, uh, I would I would contribute to that GoFundMe immediately. Uh, I don't recommend picking someone with the last name of Kennedy. That's the ultimate nepo baby. Uh, if Robert Kennedy were not given the last name Kennedy, if he was just a random person, he wouldn't be getting the attention he's getting. Welcome to 24 for 24, an interview series where I ask presidential candidates 24 pressing questions regarding the 2024 election. Today, we are joined by Chase Oliver, a libertarian presidential candidate. He has been dubbed the most influential libertarian in America by Rolling Stone. In 2022, Oliver ran for U.S. Senate in Georgia. He's credited with causing the runoff election between Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. At just 38 years old, Oliver is less than half the age of both Biden and Trump. So stay tuned to find out why Chase Oliver is the right guy to challenge America's aging Oval Office. We will just kick right off with it then with the first question. It's about millennials. Do you think that they are just complainers or is the wealth engine that boomers benefited from really gone? And if it is broken and gone, how will you fix that for millennials? Well, I am a millennial and uh, I do feel the economic pressure that millennials across the country are feeling. It's an absolutely real thing. Uh, people in my age range, you know, uh, our parents at this point in time were already owning a home, starting their families, you know, like, uh, I felt like much of our generation feels like, uh, we're losing out or that we're falling behind. Um, now I will say this, you know, uh, I think we can fix this if we get our economy in order. Uh, it starts with balancing our budget and stopping printing trillions of dollars out of thin air that creates this inflation that we're all feeling. So, um, you know, my first step as president to start addressing these issues would be to start seeing our government live within its means, just like we all have to, and uh, really start bringing those uh, solutions back to the local level, because the federal government is, frankly, trillions of dollars in debt. It's not going, uh, getting any better. And so we, we need to take uh, drastic measures to slash the federal budget. But much of these uh, problems that we face, like the cost of housing, that's a local issue that's caused by the inability to build housing through regulation. We can fix that. Uh, and there's a lot of other issues with cost of living that we can fix at the local level that don't necessarily need the federal answer. How do you do that if you become president and the left and right both just spend money like it's going out of like they don't care? There is no fiscal responsibility for either party. So you come in, you get elected, you're libertarian. How do you make them mind the little children in Congress? Well, the first thing you do is you have the power of the veto. So if a budget is not balanced, uh, I would signal that it would be immediately vetoed. Uh, and so any new debt would be on the backs of the Republicans and Democrats. And from then, that point, you use the bully pulpit to make sure voters know exactly who is continuing to add debts and deficits to them. Uh, and hopefully challengers will take them out. And by the second half of your first term, you're getting balanced budgets because the American people will be demanding it. Most people live in a state that requires their state to have a balanced budget. It shouldn't be uh, a radical idea that our nation balances its budget. That should be a rational idea. We'll just move right along to the second one then. It's another kind of generational question. As a millennial, I can't stand Nepo babies. I think a lot of us can't. We feel like they cheated the system. Trump put a lot of his family members in the White House. Biden did the same thing. If you become president, would you be able to say, I'm not going to put my friends and family in here and just make it a giant Nepo baby conference and a bunch of favoritism? Because it just seems like everybody says, oh, meritocracy, especially on the right. And then their daughter or their son is always the best person. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, I don't plan on doing that first off because I'm not a member of the political elite. So I don't have a bunch of family members who are needing those connections to move higher up in the food chain. Uh, I would find the best people for the best job, uh, regardless of uh, their background or where they've come from, if they can do the job effectively and push through our vision for what we want to do for the country. Uh, that's the thing that I'm looking for, uh, particularly in, say, like a cabinet level position this you know you know if you're looking for a political outsider if you're looking for a candidate that's going to be coming from outside of the political sphere and shake things up uh, i don't recommend picking someone with the last name of kennedy that's the ultimate nepo baby uh, if robert kennedy were not given the last name kennedy if he was just a random person he wouldn't be getting the attention he's getting he would never have gotten the attention he got uh throughout his life uh, and so he is somebody who has basically lived on the privilege that he's existed with by having a father and an uncle who, uh, you know, one was running for president, the other one was president. And uh, he, he gets to use that Kennedy legacy, even though other members of his family disavow him. You know, the, just to me, uh, he is kind of the ultimate Nepo baby candidate.
just like George W. Bush was. And, you know, I'm tired of seeing political dynasties in this country and I'm a regular person. And maybe it's time that we have a regular working guy uh, to be in the office. It would be nice. I was going to ask you a little bit later about RFK, because when I asked Rectumwald about him, he said he was controlled opposition. Do you think RFK is controlled opposition or just kind of a Nepo baby with a lot of money and free time? Oh, I don't think he's like, I don't think there's some grand conspiracy to have him like help one candidate or the other. Honestly, I just think he's somebody who sees uh, what a lot of us are seeing, which is dissatisfaction with the voters, with Trump and Biden. He feels like he has a lane. Uh, and I feel like the Libertarian Party has a lane that, honestly, if you're really wanting to build up opposition to the two-party system, you have a better bet going with the Libertarian Party than with Robert Kennedy. Because with the Libertarian Party, your vote can help us with ballot access or get major party status or elect Libertarians in the down ballot. RFK doesn't have any of those things for the most part. Uh, he doesn't have down ballot candidates. He doesn't have uh, party infrastructure that he can help build with his votes. So if you're really wanting to build an opposition to the two-party system, your better bet is with the Libertarian Party. It's going to go much further. There's Sometimes, I, you know, you read that Kennedy's thinking about going to the Libertarian Party to run, switch again. Do you think the Libertarian Party would accept that? I have seen absolutely zero appetite from the delegates, the people who would actually select our nominee for Robert Kennedy being a nominee. And I think over two-thirds of the delegates have already been selected in all the states. And so if it's based on the body that is currently going to be heading to Washington, D.C., there is no path to victory for Robert Kennedy. Uh, in fact, I think he would lose a convention. It would kill his campaign dead in its tracks and probably boost myself or whoever does win the nomination over him. Uh, but I, I, I don't think he's going to because it's too big of a risk and he knows he's going to lose. OK, so just kind of basically fake news, lying media, stirring stuff up, because I feel like. At least once a week, I read some article, oh, Kennedy's going to go. And I'm thinking, he doesn't square with libertarians. Like, how would that? I think he's trying to flirt for a certain segment of our voters. And this is why he's kind of teasing that, because he's dipping his toe into our waters. And sadly, you know, a few uh, libertarians are kind of like, you know, giving him that room to be able to come in and kind of swoop down and take some of our voters. Um, but I don't think he's interested in getting our party's nomination. He might want to steal some of our voters away, but he doesn't want our party's nomination. Um, we'll move on to some COVID questions. Do you support a constitutional amendment to prevent the government from mandating any vaccine, not just COVID, any vaccine across the board? I oppose mandates across the board. I'm a bodily autonomy guy. Uh, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, congressional amendment, while I would support it, I feel like it's never going to happen because of the difficulty of passing congressional amendments in this country. It's increasingly more difficult, you know, uh, you know, to, to do than say passing a law, you know, you would need three quarters of the states uh, and, and, a, and a super majority in the Congress in both houses uh, to get that done. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's only happened 27 times, I believe, in the history of our entire country. So, like, uh, I don't think that's going to be, you know, anything that's going to realistically happen as much as I would like it to, unfortunately, because, Right now, we live in a world with Democrats and Republicans in charge. And by the time we uh, change that uh, paradigm, it might be a long time away from when people think about that stuff. Um, but ideally, yes, I would like to have something like that. Uh, I would like to secure people's bodily autonomy by whatever means possible. OK, well, the next question was about would you support legislation or amendment prohibiting masking and testing mandates? And obviously, you kind of answered that there, bodily autonomy. Well, as far as uh, masking... <clears throat> Frankly, I do support, you know, we do have to remember there is property rights there. You know, a business has the right to say you have to wear a shirt and shoes to come in my gas station, right? Uh, similarly, somebody could say, hey, you have to wear a mask to come on my property. That is a property right. Now, will that person lose business? Probably. Will that affect their bottom line? You bet. And that's the way the free market works. If you limit your customer base, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot. But we do have to remember that property rights do exist. And that does go for, you know, while the government can't mandate anything, uh, you as a property owner or someone who owns the business can mandate these things. And then individuals have a choice as to whether to uh, shop at your business or, you can, or use your service or conduct business with you or work for you. And this is part of the free market. And, you know, and while, yeah, it, it sucks that people would be losing out on a job. But you also have to remember the business is also losing out on best talent. And another business can come in and hire that person and say, we just got the best talent because you are limiting your base based on some arbitrary thing. 
And uh, that's the way the market does need to work because ultimately those who are most free and accepting of freedom in their individual business, uh, the people who allow customers from all over to, uh, or for whatever, to be able to utilize their services, those are the people who last the longest. Those who limit themselves are due to fall by the wayside, either through limiting their customer base or they will outrage enough people to cause boycotts. Would you abide by or cancel the international health regulation amendments that are being considered by the World Health Organization? Um, I support removing the United States from any entangling alliances. And that doesn't just include alliances with other nations. It does include these kind of international codes. There's a few that do need to exist. I, you know, I came from the maritime trade world. There's a few maritime trade laws that are international that just being able to move goods from one place to another, it's kind of needed to have those things. Uh, but outside of that, no, we shouldn't be using mandates from a body that is made up of people who are not elected to represent Americans to control Americans. And so I would seek to remove ourselves from any such agreements and uh, we can lead the way on things and people can lead by our, you know, we can lead by example, uh, for instance, on things like, you know, uh, technology and infrastructure and these kinds of things through the free market. But we don't have to be joining some sort of international group pushing that on anybody and certainly not having anything pushed upon us. An economic question for you here. What's your position on central bank digital currencies? The short answer is I oppose it with every fiber of my being. Uh, but to just expound upon that, the reason why I expose central, uh, oppose central bank digital currency is because uh, if it is implemented, it means the end of a cash society as we know it, which means an end to privacy in terms of commerce as we know it. You know, if I wanna, if I wanna pay, uh, pay a random guy down the road 30 bucks to mow my lawn, you know, under the table, well, I can do that with cash. Heck, I can even do it with some, you know, secure payment platforms. What you can't do it is with a CBDC when they say, no, 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 that person has to pay their taxes. You have to, you have to pay for that. And if you don't do it, ah, it, you know, you're in trouble. You're in trouble with the IRS. And then the other problem with that is, is it ultimately can be used to crush actual dissent in this country. Imagine, if you will, we have an authoritarian, former reality TV show host, who really hates his enemies, hates hearing bad things about himself, doesn't like certain people and certain populations, and he decides, I don't like those people protesting against me. Turn off their money. And we have given right now ourselves, the, the, the federal government, the ability to declare martial law, to create emergency conditions to where a president theoretically could do that. And that should scare the crap out of everyone, that you could literally have your wallet turned off by a government that doesn't like the things you're saying. Because at that point, the Constitution is just a piece of paper and it's not defending anything. And so we must absolutely oppose CBDCs, try to get ourselves back to a sound monetary policy where our money is actually backed by something like gold or silver, and as much as possible, separate our currency from the state using things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that fully remove you and your wealth from the state and give you more financial autonomy. That should be a part of anybody's financial portfolio over the long term. Would you kind of maybe expound on Bitcoin a little bit? Because it's a ladies love politics, mostly female audience. Or at least I try to aim it towards that. And I don't think women really get Bitcoin. It's kind of a male dominated bro bromance going on. Could you just like in 30 seconds, maybe encapsulate what Bitcoin is, how it works briefly without all the technical. Yeah. So I'm not a, I'm not I'll be frank, but uh, what I will say is, is, you know, Bitcoin is essentially it's a financial uh, it's a financial institution that is free from the state. It is uh, basically the ability to trade out your dollars into a currency that is not backed by any central bank. And it is uh, and it is audible. You're allowed to audit it through a blockchain, which makes it uh, highly secure. And so uh, this is a way to remove your money completely from the fiat currency system. Uh, and what it, one of the things that's done amazingly is, you know, I work, I used to work for organizations that work in the Liberty sphere and we would have people who would work for the, uh, this organization that lived in really autocratic nations, places with pretty, uh, despotic, tyrannical governments. And if you're a Liberty activist, uh, you know, if you were getting paid in their, in, in their bank dollars or bank notes, you know, uh, it might be easy to crack down upon you. Uh, not so when they're being paid in Bitcoin because it crosses borders and boundaries. And so it is a way to free people up and free their financial uh, uh, liberty 
away from states, no matter how autocratic they are. Now, of course, you know, North Korea has no internet. You can't really get Bitcoin if you don't have access to the internet. But as long as you're somewhere in the world that can access your Bitcoin wallet, you should be able to pull your wealth out and use it. Uh, and so it's a great tool towards uh, getting around unjust uh, state actors trying to steal your money, essentially. I'm going to totally switch gears here. Why do women reject libertarianism and how can libertarians try to appeal to women? Yeah, I think the first thing comes uh, with listening to women. You know, uh, I've traveled across the country and I've attended a lot of festivals and fairs and political events that are not necessarily just libertarians. And that's where, you know, because libertarians are mostly male, you run into more women in these kinds of situations where you're meeting random people. Uh, and the first thing that I always talk about um, is I ask them, what is the most important issues to you? Now, I will say this, the most important issue for women in this election, it seems to be based on my anecdotal research of speaking with thousands of them, uh, is bodily autonomy and medical freedom, both, both the COVID stuff, but also uh, with Roe v. Wade and Dobbs. There seems to be a huge upswell of pro-choice women who that is making them a almost a single issue voter. It's a litmus test for whether they can you know, I literally had women ask me, I am pro-choice and um, we can get into that further in a little bit. But uh, when I tell someone that I am, a lot of women go, whoo, OK, I can keep talking to you. you. You've made it past the first roadblock that I would put up if a male politician is, is, is trying to come at me. Uh, and I've noticed this feeling. This has definitely changed from even 2022, uh, right when this was starting. Like it is now it, it, it has definitely even continued further. Uh, and the other issue is talking about what is important to them. And many times it is uh, the ability to get a job or start a small business. Many women are entrepreneurs and they want the ability to start their small business free from as much red tape and BS and taxation as they can, uh, because many times they're doing this to supplement a family income. You know, they have, you know, per perhaps a partner who works and they say, hey, I want to start a small business and uh, this is something I want to pour myself into, but I can't do that because there are so many barriers created by the state. Or, uh, you know, or even when it gets down to either uh, family issues, which is important to both men and women, but it's something we don't do well enough to talk about in libertarian politics. Uh, when I would approach a parent, be it a father or a mother, uh, the first thing I would say to them is, is, I see you have a child here. I bet you have unconditional love for your kids, don't you? And they would always say, yeah, you know, I'd do whatever, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a mama bear or I would take a bullet if I had to. Uh, and I say, you know, that's good. You're going to, you have unconditional love, which means you have the most vested interest in seeing your children survive and thrive and prosper in this world. So why do we take agency away from you and give it to a centralized federal government? These bureaucrats don't know your children. They don't know what makes them special. They don't know the challenges that they need to overcome that they might need help with, but you do. So let's take power out of their hands and put it in your hands. Not even, not even just DC, but take it out of the state house's hands. And put it in the hands of parents, whether it's to decide the medical choices for their children, the educational choices for their children. You know, these are the these the, really any aspect of parenthood should centrally be controlled by the family. Uh, and when I when I relay that message to Democrats, Republicans, independent women, it resonates. Doesn't matter where what political party or or where they're coming from on the spectrum, they resonate with. You know what? I should have more say so in my family's life. And we should have more control over what happens in our household than the government. And that's usually where I start the conversation, particularly with, uh, with, with mothers, uh, because I feel like too often they're paid lip service and give government solutions when they could solve these problems themselves if they had more agency. You seem to have definitely thought about it. What do you think about the party as a whole? I think the party as a whole does need to, yeah, I, I do think the party as a whole needs to re-embrace speaking to women. And just the way that I, just the way that I said, we should embrace women in leadership. We need more women candidates. We need more uh, women on staff at the national party. Uh, it wasn't long ago. Uh, I believe it was in 2020. We had a majority board that was made up of women and LGBTQ people uh, on, on the board. We had great representation across the spectrum. Uh, on our national committee. I would like to see more of that in the future because I think our party should look like America. Um, and, and with that, you know, I hope, you know, our membership can reach out to, you know, every one of these men in our party has a sister or a mother or a daughter or a wife 
why can't we communicate our values in a way that like makes sense to them? And, you know, I'm just a, you know, I'm LGBT. I don't have a wife. I do have nieces though. And part of the reason why I'm fighting for a more free world is because I want my nieces to be women of agency and power for them to be able to decide for themselves, not be dependent necessarily on a husband if they don't want to be, but if they want to be part of a family to have as much agency over their family as possible. Uh, but really I want them to have maximum amount of choices in their life. And that does include things like healthcare and, uh, and, and body autonomy and being pro-choice. I know we have pro-life members and I highly respect their point of view, but I do think we need to make sure we have a place for women who are pro-choice without shaming them in this party. Well, let's get into that a little bit about pro-choice. Cause that was a question later on I have here. When do you think life begins then your pro-choice like explain when do you think it begins? And if it, I don't know if you think it begins at conception. If it does, why can someone abort it? Flesh that out a I little think bit. life begins when they take the first, first breath of life free from the womb. This is why I support the right to have an abortion up to the point of viability. Uh, you know, I only support the idea of abortion after viability if the life of the mother is directly threatened. And I came to this conclusion after a lot of prayer and, and thought and consultation, like where, you know, um, and, and where as a man, you know, who's never going to have a uterus and never going to have the burden of pregnancy, which is a major medical burden. It is a life-changing event. Uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is a large commitment to, be, to going through a pregnancy. Um, and being someone who will never go through that, I had to really try to put myself in the shoes of people who would. And um, with that, I, I spoke to a lot of my female friends you know, I understand the, the commonality of, of miscarriages. And if life begins a conception, well, then what is a miscarriage? You know, is it manslaughter because your body rejected the pregnancy? Like you can't control those things. Uh, and it comes with the, the knowledge of how many of my female friends have been sexually assaulted or raped throughout their lives. And what if they had become pregnant as a result? And what decision would they have to make? And so I really think long and hard about it. And it's, it's not something that I came to very willy nilly. Um, but I believe in, you know, uh, that women should have the autonomy that, you know, and I, and I also think about the, just the concept of bodily autonomy like this. If you and me were walking down the street and you trip me and I happen to fall on something that, that, that cut me really bad and I start bleeding I'm bleeding very badly, but you manage to get me to the hospital. And they say, okay, well, Courtney Chase has lost a lot of blood, but you're his same blood type. You can get a blood transfusion and save his life. They cannot force you to give me the blood transfusion. They can't even tell you, you know, you're a good person if you do this and a bad person if you don't. They cannot compel you. That is part of bodily autonomy. So even if you were part of the party that, created the need like right so like through your actions you've created this new medical emergency you can't be compelled to keep that alive because you have autonomy it is the same with a woman she can be a, an actor in the act of sexual intercourse and through that become pregnant and she is still not compelled to risk her life to save another now that sounds very harsh in the abstract and that does i admit that but that is ultimately where, I mean, but in the real world, you don't have to save my life. Now, it might sound cruel to say, well, I like my blood and Chase isn't getting any of it. Uh, but that is your decision to make. It's your conscience. You have to live with it. And ultimately, women who decide to have an abortion, it's on their conscience, not mine. And it should be something that they have to handle. As harsh as it may sound, to you or me, or as not harsh as it may seem to some people to say, I have a right to do this. I'm going to do it. Um, and then we have to take into account again, the aspects of sexual assault and, and, uh, and these kinds of things. And so I would like to have a world with less abortion. Uh, I think there are ways to do that without outright outlawing it. You can make birth control over the counter. You can increase, uh, education around, uh, contraception, as well as protecting yourself from sexual assault and understanding the signs and warning signs of, uh, of abuse so that you can help pull friends and family out of abuse if they see it occurring. 
Uh, we can increase the avenues for adoption by reducing the red tape and regulation around adoption, making it less expensive as an option for people. And so when more people adopt, more people see adoption uh, as a viable alternative to abortion. There's all kinds of things we can do to decrease the numbers of abortions in this country without outright outlawing the practice. And I will finish with this. I am also a supporter of the Hyde Amendment. Don't believe federal dollars should go to fund abortion because I do believe there are people who genuinely have a feeling that life does begin at conception. And it is, a, it is a deeply held belief of theirs and we should not be taking tax money out of their pocket to fund something that they view as, as ultimately immoral. I believe those of us who are pro-choice can fund that through our donations to Planned Parenthood and other organizations without the government doing it. Yes, I do believe codifying it, Roe v. Wade and Casey uh, into law, because I do believe this is this is something that rises above uh, a, a state's rights question. This is a this is a fundamental right, uh, and it falls under things like medical privacy and the, you know and, and other constitutional protections. Uh, that we need to be looking at. Let's move on to criminal justice reform. What actions would you take to end the war on drugs? Um, so I look to uh, Portugal as an example of what we can do. They had the highest heroin rate uh, use in all of Western Europe. And in the early 2000s, they combated this by decriminalizing all drugs and changing this from a law enforcement model to a medical uh, public health model. Uh, they basically said, hey, we're going to decriminalize drugs. Now, if we see you using in the streets, we're going to give you a, a we're going to refer you to go seek a rehab facility to go see a counselor. Uh, now, they do it through government funding. I believe it's better done through direct mutual aid so societies that can voluntarily fund these organizations to, to create easy avenues to rehab. I think centrally planning rehab is kind of a dumb idea. Uh, but I think through the decriminalization model, we can destigmatize addiction to where A, those who want help can get it without fear of arrest, and, uh, and B, those who are still using can do what you can do in Portugal. If you have heroin in Portugal, you can actually take it to a pharmacy, pay a small fee, and they will test it for you to tell you whether there's fentanyl or anything else in it, because that's how many of these overdoses are happening. People think they're taking a Valium, or they think they're taking a Xanax, and they're really taking a fentanyl tablet. Uh, and so if people were able to safely test their supply, you would see far less overdoses. And those people, instead of overdosing and dying, would have a better chance of seeking help eventually for their problem. Uh, and so I think the best way to address the war on drugs is to stop having a war on drugs and start having a real look at how, what we can do to curb addiction through destigmatization and direct and mutual aid in our communities. Uh, and I, you know, I always shout out an organization. Uh, they're one of the best that I know. It's called Shred the Stigma Oklahoma. Uh, this uh, guy, he founded this organization. They give out free Narcan, fentanyl tests, and clean needles to, to users. It's not because they love that they use drugs, but then they know that these things can save lives. And they've saved over 1,600 lives from overdose. That's 1,600 people in Tulsa and Oklahoma City who would be dead otherwise, who now have a chance to get clean, and many of them have. And so this is the kind of work that we can do to curb addiction. We'll also stop fighting a war on drugs, stop filling up prison beds with victimless criminals, people who are just basically drug users who they don't need to be in a prison bed. If, if anything, they need to be in a rehab bed. Uh, and so we need to we need to find ways to change what's going on with regard to the war on drugs. And I believe an absolute decriminalization model is the best way to do it. How do you get half the country Republicans to see that? Because so many of them boomers, they just tell you, oh, <clears throat> we is so bad. It's so dangerous. Donald Trump's out here wanting to put drug dealers up for the death penalty. How do you get through to people to make them think the world isn't going to be in chaos if we decriminalize drugs? I think part of that is, uh, you know, starting to use the, uh, use the campaign trail to actually uh, educate people on things that, you know, just the Portugal model, like I was talking about, because uh, when we see the proof is in the pudding, like this is not something new that has been happening. This has been happening since like the turn of the century. And so now we have 20 years of, of data that shows that this has been overall a success in Portugal. Uh, they are one, now one of the lowest heroin use rates in all of Western Europe. Uh, they've curbed their HIV and hepatitis uh, rates, which were going through the roof, but now have stabilized. Now, they still have a higher than normal rate, but that's because people, thank God, live longer with HIV and hepatitis than they used to. Uh, but they have basically flattened the new cases. Uh, and so this is a, just a proof positive that this kind of model works and we could adapt this 
to work in a country as vast as the United States. It's not going to be an exact translation one to the other, but it's got to work certainly better than the 50 years we have done where, you know, if anything, the, in the war on drugs, drugs have won because drugs are more available, cheaper, and more potent than they were at the beginning of this war on drugs. And so if anything, government has failed and they must look for a new solution. And I, and I say this as somebody who, you know, I don't want to see addicts all over the streets. I think this is a way to prevent that. Okay. So more compassionate way. Okay. Yeah, I would appeal many times, particularly to Republicans, compassion and empathy. You know, many of these people are evangelicals and they, they need to understand that part of our faith, and I speak as a Christian, is reaching out to those who society needs, you know, people need who need help. And part of that is doing it judgment free and trying to bring them to, to, to health and wellness without stigmatizing them. Another one on criminal justice here. Um, the U.S. incarcerates more people in sheer numbers and per capita than any other nation in the world. That includes North Korea. Our police are more militarized than ever, with 80 percent of SWAT raids being drug related. And more than 180 people have been exonerated from death row. Why is the criminal justice system broken and how would you fix it? Well, there's a lot of systemic issues with the justice system, and it starts, you know, with that first interaction with police. The fact that uh, police are left on a different standard <clears throat> when it comes to uh, having to be held liable for wrongdoing because of the doctrine of qualified immunity. Uh, it basically allows them to, to hide from civil judgment a lot of the time. Courts throw out all kinds of cases uh, do this created out of thin air doctrine that came from the Supreme Court. There's never legislation. There's nothing in the Constitution for it. Uh, and I think we need to end it because I think if you do wrong as a police officer, people should be able to seek recompense in civil court. They should be able to seek a judgment against you. Uh, the next step to this, though, is uh, requiring that police officers hold liability insurance, uh, because when they do that and they do wrong, that payment comes out of the insurance policy, not out of the other taxpayer funded services like infrastructure, you know, schools and these things that are locally funded. Right. Uh, nobody. You know, you don't want to see, oh, well, the, te the police are so terrible here that we had to take all of our money for everything else. And now the roads suck, the school, right? So uh, you would want to have liability policies. The other bonus of that liability policy is uh, when the officer does wrong too many times, he effectively becomes uninsurable and unhirable. And so it's a free market mechanism to keep the worst officers off the streets. There's no judgment here. There's no bias. There's no blue line to stand behind. You're uninsurable, buddy. You can't do this job. You have to go find something else, preferably one that doesn't have a gun and a badge attached to it because you've shown yourself to not be very good at that. Um, you know, uh, and I think that's a free market mechanism to, to basically fix a lot of the bad policing that we see in our, our communities across the country. Then we have to look at other systemic issues like uh, the the idea of mandatory minimums. This ties the hands of judges to treat things on the literal case by case basis uh, that judges are supposed to be doing. You know, uh, that's where the term case by case comes from. Is each individual case might have a different outcome in terms of sentencing. So we want to do away with mandatory minimums. Uh, we also want to look at the sentencing disparity that does happen between the races and does happen between those who are poor and rich. Much of this is to do with the fact that we have an overcriminalized society and uh, too many people take the plea deal uh, because it takes forever to get your day in court. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's just too expensive to have to fight back. And this is why we have to end the overcriminalization of victimless crimes. You know, if there's no victim, there should be no crime. This involves drug use. This involves, uh, you know, sex work uh, between consenting people. Uh, any crime that there is no discernible victim, there is no force, fraud, coercion, theft, or violence, uh, that's not a crime. And we should seek to remove that from the criminal code and so we can save those prison beds for those who are actually committing crimes and put them through trials instead of plea bargains. Uh, I'm against the death penalty uh, because of the exact reason you mentioned you cannot unkill someone. You can release someone from prisons after decades if they are found to have done, you know, been exonerated. Uh, and, and that's terrible and tragic in its own right. But um, killing someone and then finding out later that, oopsie, we made a mistake. Uh, that's just immoral and unconscionable, and we should join the majority of the world that has outlawed the death penalty. Uh, and, but I could go further and further, but just really at every aspect, uh, we need to fix the disparity between the people and the government in a court of law, interactions with law enforcement. Uh, and then lastly, I oppose private prisons. May sound crazy for a libertarian to oppose privatizing something, uh, but I think when you have privatized prisons, you create a profit motive of filling those beds. 
And that's where the lobbying comes in to increase the criminalization and increase the mandatory minimums uh, and the time people spend in those beds. And so while I'm a minarchist, I believe the government should be minimal and it's uh, what it does. One of those things should be administering its own prisons and not creating a profit motive around it. It should cost us to separate people from society. Okay. Yeah, I was going to follow up with that because I asked Rectum Wald and he was like, oh, privatize the prisons and everything works itself out. I, I don't, I, I sincerely don't believe that to be the case. And having visited both public and private prisons, I can tell you the uh, prisoners are far more miserable in private prisons. Okay. Going to move on to something. I get outside of criminal justice and talk about the 2020 election because I want to get flagged on YouTube. So do you think it was stolen? Be it drug mules, ballots, Dominion voting system. And if it was stolen, why should we even care about voting in the first place? Because they'll just do it again. So I think in every election, there's some disparity. There's a little bit of funny business here and there. That, that's every election, though. I, I don't believe that there's enough evidence to show that there was enough funny business that this would have flipped it one way or the other. I think Biden won the election. I do think he got the most votes, the most electoral votes. Uh, crazily enough, people have put him and Donald Trump up again. I don't know uh, why people, I guess people in this country are a bit masochistic in their nature. Uh, because they have given us this as the major party choices again. Uh, but I do believe that, uh, yeah, I believe Trump won in 2016 electorally. I believe uh, Biden won in 2020. And uh, God help us if either one of them win again in 2024. This is why I'm running, <laughs> is to provide Americans with a much better option uh, than either of them. Uh, but I also would like to see more transparency in our elections. This is why I support hand-marked paper ballots. Uh, Maybe I'm just an analog guy in a digital world, but you can't hack paper. You can, you know, you can falsify ballots. You can do all kinds of things, but you can't do this in a way that, you know, electronically where people can't see it and where the layman can't see it. Uh, and so I prefer hand-marked paper ballots. Uh, you know, sometimes old school is best. And uh, that's kind of where I would like to see ourselves moving away from these electronic voting systems. January 6th. They have received a combined total of nearly 850 years worth of prison sentences. Individuals like Zach Real, Joe Biggs, Stuart Rhodes, and Enrique Otario received the longest sentences, ranging from 15 to 22 years. Those sentences are longer than the ones given to the four people that got sentenced at the Nuremberg trials. So why should they serve longer sentences than Nazis? And as president, would you pardon all nonviolent January 6th protesters? Well, I think comparing things to the Nuremberg trial is a little is a little different. Uh, and, you know, what I would like to see is, is ultimately um, January 6th was neither the end of democracy as we know it, nor a guided rope tour through the Capitol. Like, I think anybody who wants to objectively talk about the subject needs to needs to say this, like. There was not columns of armed soldiers and tanks coming to the streets to provide a coup d'etat. But there was also not just like, oh, we just walked through the Capitol, la di da. Like there was lots of <laughs> it was it, it was it was so outrageous that all of America was watching on their television screen, you know. So it was obviously something that was not normal. Uh, do I think that some of these punishments have been uh much more than they should have been? Yes. And that's on a case by case basis. I'm not gonna speak to every Individual, because God knows there was a lot of people there that day. Uh, but I do think there are a lot of people who spent time in jail, and this is particularly due to COVID and the way the courts were working. They spent time in jail longer than the, what the maximum sentence of their misdemeanor trespassing charge or, or something to that effect would have been. Uh, all of those people should have been let out of jail the day they hit the maximum of what they were being charged with. I kind of feel like that's kind of incumbent upon you know, the right to a speedy trial, that if you're you sit in jail for a year and the maximum sentence was nine months, like it's kind of BS. You've been separated from society in jail and you should be released and pardoned for that. Uh, the, the, they should go ahead and just no longer be charging you. Uh, and again, that's not good enough to just say oopsie, like that's that's wrong. And in fact, those people should be able to sue in court and say, you know, their, their civil rights were violated. Uh, and I would seek to pardon those people. Uh, but and everything has to go on a case by case basis. Like I was mentioning earlier, I can't blanket to say I would pardon everybody from doing everything because there were some people who were like hitting police officers with flagpoles like that, I think, is uh, a little outrageous. I think the family of those people would also say that. 
I think the family of many of the protesters would say, geez, my uncle and my dad was going a little crazy that day. Uh, it's a heightened mob activity. Um, but someone similarly, like that, Enrique Otario it, wasn't even there on January 6th. Yeah. And he got 22 years for conspiracy. Like, do you think that's a little too far? Um, again, I don't know the exact reference to the case, but if he is, uh, you know, and, and conspiracy can mean all kinds of things. Conspiracy can mean you are as part of a group chat that something was happening on, or conspiracy can mean you were actually trying to plan some sort of action that would have caused harm or disrupted the, the, the electoral process. It's a broad thing. So I would have to look more in depth to it, but um, you know, I would say those who are committing violence on the ground should be the ones who are probably getting prosecuted the hardest. I would think those who are actually committing crimes of like violence or, or uh, you know, the people who are smearing crap on the walls, like, that nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Like, that's gross. Like, don't do that. Uh, and those are the people you should be maybe probably charging with crimes, not people who had, who were on part of group chats or whatever that had no direct planning. But again, I can't speak to individual cases that I don't know about. Yeah. Let's talk about the Ukraine war. Is funding Ukraine and also Israel's war in America's national security interest why or why not? And then a little caveat to the Israel question. Do you think they're committing a genocide? So we'll start with, well, let me just say for both. No, I don't support the United States funding militarily either. I support removing the military footprint from every continent, from every country that is the United States of America. Uh, ideally, our military should be only to protect us from sovereign invasion. And we should only be going to war when Congress declares it. Now, with regards to Ukraine, support the rights of the Ukrainians to defend themselves. They were invaded by Russia. Uh, no amount of, well, well, NATO was too close. That does that does not give justification for Russia to invade a non-NATO nation, frankly, uh, and, and to be doing that. So I support the right of the, the Ukrainian people to defend themselves. And if individual people want to give money to Ukraine, I suppose you should be able to do that. You should. Absolutely. I don't want our government doing that because that entangles ourselves and our military in the possibility that we have to get involved one day. Now, uh, my policy on Ukraine is simple. I think we should be allowing refugees who are stuck in the war zone to come here as refugees to the United States. And I think those who are conscripted by the military on either side who don't want to fight should be able to come to the United States in an asylum claim. I think this would heavily demoralize the Russian military, which is mostly made up of conscripts at this point. Uh, there's far more, you know, there's far more Ukrainians who want to fight because they are defending their homeland than Russians who want to go into Ukraine and freeze and die. And so I think with this policy, you would see a major demoralization of the Russian military. Uh, and frankly, it fits in line with my policy of saying nobody should be forced to fight in the military that they don't want to. I oppose our own draft for that very reason. Uh, and then moving on to Israel, uh, October 7th was disgusting. You know, what happened in Israel was horrific. But the two things that we have to say here are, one, we have to objectively examine the motives and the, and the conditions in the Gaza and West Bank territories that have allowed violence to surface because desperate people do desperate things and horrible things when they feel they're backed into a corner. And we cannot just start this thing on October 7th. You have to look at the entire history of the conflict. Uh, but post October 7th, I think anybody would say Israel is justified to respond in some sort of way. But what they're doing right now is not the way that is in any way justified. Airstrikes that kill tens of thousands of people is not self-defense. That's not surgical. That's not just taking out Hamas. That is a that is a broad strokes killing many innocent people. A genocide, I think under many international definitions of, as of genocide, yes. I, we need a ceasefire now. We need a ceasefire now, and we do need a release of the hostages. That's the question that always gets asked when I say we need a ceasefire. Well, what about hostages? Of course the hostages should be released. They're innocent people. All of these people who are not Hamas, and not the Israeli military are innocent in all this. Many people in Israel themselves know that what's going on with what the government is doing is wrong. And it won't make Israel more safe and more stable. Because this policy of airstrikes and killing so many people, it agitates the Palestinians, creates further conditions for more violence to brew, for more radicalization to occur. It angers the Arab neighbors of Israel, many of whom are on a, are on a tentative peace and some who have not declared outright peace with this neighbor. And so if you ever want to have a, a world where Israel is at peace with the Arab neighbors, this is not the path to take. And I think many people in Israel realize this as well. 
This is also why. Why are they doing this? Why do they not call the ceasefire? It's because Netanyahu knows. Why do they call for a temporary ceasefire at best and not a permanent one? Because the Netanyahu government knows as soon as this war ends, they are going to be put out by their own people. People who have already had questions about internal corruption from the Netanyahu government and now have serious questions and want to see serious investigations as to why October 7th occurred, why Israel did not see this coming and why they didn't do things to stop it as quickly as they did. And so this is why this is being perpetrated, because the very Netanyahu government knows that as soon as the bombs stop dropping, the questions start being asked by the local population. And so I demand a ceasefire now. Joe Biden as president should have been calling for it forcefully for months at this point. It is ridiculous. And this and what we are getting right now, airdropping. Oh, they airdropped 30,000 food for 30,000 people. Well, 30,000 people are dead. And you know how they died? Because bombs were dropped that were bought and paid for by the United States. And so does it make me feel good? Oh, we fed 30,000 people. No, it makes me feel horrible about the fact that there's 30,000 more plus that are not alive in this world today. And that is because of our warfare state. It's because of our unapologetic backing of this. And we have to change course. Why do you think that we... I mean, there's the Israel Jewish lobby obviously puts a lot of money into politicians, but why do people seem to be blinded by the fact that we're helping blow up children? I get why politicians support it because their pockets are getting lined, but in evangelicals, Christians, you talk to them about Israel and Palestine and they immediately freak out about October 7th and act like you want Jews to be dead. What's that barrier and how do we get through it? I think, you know, I think a lot of this does come from that faith-based viewpoint of like, you know, this is the Holy Land and they they view Israel as partners in this and that they need to have, you know, a Jewish homeland in order for, you know, the next part of their uh, the religious philosophy to start happening, which is the end times, right? Like this is there, there are people who literally are doing this because they feel like Israel has to have their homeland in order for Jesus to return. And they are facilitating this by letting Israel do what they're going to do. Uh, and I just think that that's a bad excuse. Uh, personally. Uh, and a lot of this just comes from also, you know, traditional, we, we, we always say Judeo Christian values, right? That is a mantra of the right. And so it it just seems natural for many on the right to just fall into saying, okay, Judeo Christian values, we must fall in line. Never mind the fact that this has also been a, a, a birthplace of much of, you know, the Islamic faith, uh, that this region of the world also has deep traditions in, in all of the Abramatic faiths, not just two of the three, but that all three Abramatic faiths actually have their home in the Holy Land. And so this is like, uh, and, and I do also feel like, yeah, there is a lot of national, and not just, not just the Israel lobby, but also the national security lobby. You know, if there's a crisis in the Middle East, well, that's money for Raytheon and Boeing and other people to make by selling their weapon systems. So even beyond the idea of like, some sort of like religious thing or, or religious conviction or, or, you know, stuff like that. There's also the national security wing of the Republican party that the neocon wing that they, they make money off of, you know, campaign contributions from these giant firms. And if there's no bombs to build and bombs to sell, well, then there's no money to be made. Uh, I frankly think Boeing needs to focus more on their passenger planes uh, at this point than uh, the military technology they're sending just based on the doors flying off that we see in the media uh, and, you know, and Raytheon and, and Halliburton and these other, they can build other things. You know, you don't have to build weapons of war that kill little kids. You know, you don't have to go to bed at night knowing that you have, you know, if you work for Raytheon or Boeing or one of these other military firms, you know, uh, you don't have to go to bed knowing that you've, you've helped facilitated an industry that kills innocent people all over the world. You could find something else to do, something else to build. Trust me. And we'll be very thankful for you if you do. What's the end game? Let's say, you know. Biden or Trump get in, they have the same philosophy pretty much when it comes to Israel. You don't get elected, no libertarian does. It's the two-party system. What's the end game in Gaza? Are they just going to keep blowing up people until all two million are dead? Is it going to be World War III? How do you see this play out? I worry that that happens, and I worry that it creates an escalation that could lead to a world war. Like I, I, I do sincerely worry about this, that if we don't change course. And, you know, I do see pressure um forming around biden to change course you know i see he's he's losing ground in a lot of states where like in these primaries where he's the only name on the ballot like 12 percent of the people are marking uncommitted and that's their signal to him that if you don't change course on palestine 
that you're not going to get our votes in the fall. Uh, and so they're basically challenging him to, if you want our vote, you better earn it. And, uh, you know, I think this is good on them. If you're a Democrat who's doing that, you know, even if you're not going to vote libertarian, good on you, challenge them, force the war machine uh, forward. Right. If, if you're going to if you're going to be wanting to vote with conviction, I encourage you to vote, you know, n- no preference in your in your in your primary today here in Georgia. It's voting. It's Election Day. I'm encouraging any Democrats who vote to vote no preference and not vote for Joe Biden. Uh, and, and that being said, hopefully we can force that pressure before the election in November. And then it's a coin toss. Right. If one or the other wins. And uh, sadly, I think if if Trump wins, he's going to fully back Netanyahu. Netanyahu wants Trump to win because he knows this. And it will lead to a further genocide. Uh, I still think there's enough pressure, possibly, maybe, in a distant, distant, you know, however slight it is, it's greater than if Trump wins and he's just going to back BB Netanyahu and he's going to tell him to just flatten them all. And, uh, and if that happens, uh, I fear the escalation of the Arab world attacking Israel, which will then naturally trigger the United States into this war. And, and then we're off to the races, unfortunately. I hope not. I pray that I'm wrong. I pray that that prediction is completely wrong. And I pray that we get a ceasefire before November and that it lasts. And I'm a glass half full guy. Let's hope that optimism plays out. No, it's all good. Let's just, you know, like if you're negative, just hope you're wrong. Right. And then I'm right. See, There you go. <laughs> Let's switch gears and talk about trans rights. Does the government or the parents have the ultimate control over a child? And if it is the parents that have ultimate control, isn't banning gender affirming surgeries a violation of parental rights? Yes. Well, I don't believe in surgery for anybody under 18, but I do believe that parents ultimately are going to be the best advocate for their child. And they should be the people who is in consultation with a doctor mental health professionals and their child as to what is the best medical treatment for them, whether it's trans care or any other care. I don't like putting the government in the way there because uh, frankly, the government aren't experts. They're just, you know, elected, elected boobs that, you know, somehow managed to make their way uh, up in the world. So they're not experts. Uh, And I would much rather let parents who, again, like I said earlier, they have unconditional love. They have a vested interest in seeing their child survive and thrive. I would rather them, have more agency than a random bureaucrat or some state statute that prevents certain care. And this comes from speaking with, uh, with parents, with trans children. You know, I have taken the time to actually research and get to know both. And, and I, and I have reached, and I've talked to people on all sides of this topic. I have talked to detransitioners. I have talked to, uh, parents of trans children. I have talked to children with trans parents and the parents themselves who are uh, trans adults trying to raise families in a two parent household, you know, and, and the, and the kind of adjustment that comes with those things. Um, and at the end of the day, it seems to me that, uh, the government really doesn't have a place there for the most part. So long as there's no abuse or neglect happening, um, I'm inclined to trust parents. Uh, now if there's abuse and neglect of any kind, that is where you have to have government step in to secure the Liberty for a child. And so the thing that I get told was, well, what about Munchausen by proxy? You know, what if a parent says my child is suffering from gender dysphoria, they need to be going through this and they're not actually, well, if that can be shown to be proven, yes, absolutely. That's crime. That's neglect and abuse. But what I'm telling to those people is for the most part, that's not what we're seeing from parents. Nearly every parent of a trans child I've talked to has said, we had no idea this was coming. We didn't even know about trans stuff. We raised them the same way we raised their other siblings who are not trans or gender questioning, but they are. And we're just trying to figure it out. We are just trying to do what we can to make sure our our child is happy, that our child is feeling well. And I don't want to take that away from parents. I also don't think that the government should be imposing this either. There's, there are bills across the country that say if you don't affirm your child's gender, you must be take the, your child must be taken away. I don't believe that's fair either. I think that's wrong to do. If there's no abuse or neglect that can be proven, you shouldn't be taking children away. 
And, uh, and so I think this ultimately should be lying in the hands of parents uh, to make these decisions. Because again, you love your kids. You're going to want to see your kids survive and thrive. And if that means that, you know, they want to go by a different name, cut their hair differently, wear some different clothes, or as they get older, maybe go through some sort of medical therapies. And when they're adults, if they choose surgery, that's for them. And, and the last thing I'll say is this, is we have to remind ourselves, trans does not equal surgery. There are, are many trans people who either they can't afford it or they do not want it. It does not, it is not needed to treat their gender dysphoria to get surgery. And so uh, when we look at this country, we have 75 million young people, uh, approximately 300,000 have expressed prolonged gender dysphoria. Of that 300,000, this is 10 to 19. This is the, the number. So some of these are 18 to 19 year olds. But of that, uh, of that age group, 300,000 kids, only about 4,000 get any kind of medical intervention, namely prebury blockers or hormone therapy. And then from there, there's of those of that age range, there's only a few dozen, uh, or there's like a few dozen surge, a couple dozen surgeries that have ever been done for kids under the age of 18. And then surgery over the age of 18 naturally goes up because you're an adult, you can make those decisions. But like to me, and, and I think those few dozen under the age of 18 should be waiting to their 18, to be frank. Uh, okay. Here's my sticking point with it. I fear that if we ban surgeries, even though it is a very small amount of kids that get them, because the right is so obsessed with it right now. You would think that trans are like half the country. Yeah, they're not. If we let them ban surgery, they're not. It's a very small part. If we allow the government to ban surgeries, I, if I had kids, I would want to homeschool them and not vaccinate them. And I can see the left telling me, well, we don't want you to do that. We disagree with it. We think that's abuse. I kind of feel like if I'm a parent, and I have this crazy ideology and my kids say they're trans and they want the surgery that I should be able to take them to get surgery. I would never do that. I think it's just barbaric, but I look at it as the parent having the decision. And if the government tells me I can't do this medical thing for my kid. Well, it's also the same saying? reason why we <laughs> don't allow tattooing for children under 18, because it's permanent. It is a permanent altering of your body. And that we need to wait until one has full agency and ability to consent. And we have decided that, that is 18 years of age in our society. Uh, and, you know, yeah. I believe that if you're fully altering your body, which is what, you know, yeah. a mastectomy or a, you know, a phalloplasty or vaginoplasty would be, right? Um, we need to wait until someone is 18. Now, that doesn't mean that you cannot provide therapy for that young person. You cannot say, hey, listen, you know, I understand you're 16 and you want this now. We do need to wait a couple of years just because of this, uh, because there is, you know, you need to be able to fully consent to this. You may fully consent right now at 16, but let's give you the breathing room to decide once you're 18. And I, I believe in the same thing for, for tattooing and things like this, uh, because it is so permanent, because it is something that is, you know, something that's unalterable. For, and even more so than a tattoo, you can actually laser off a tattoo these days. You cannot... You know, I mean, I suppose you could give yourself a breast implant after removing your breasts, but you know, that's a, yeah. it's a different thing. And so I, I understand philosophically where you're coming from, um, but yeah. we have created this age of consent and this age of adulthood. And I think we need to respect that okay. in, in terms of the law, okay. particularly within all, with inalterable medical procedures. Um, now, you know, and I would say the same thing for, you know, I don't think 16 year old girls should be getting nose jobs, like un unnecessary cosmetic surgery. Now, if you needed, a, mm -hmm. and, th and that, uh, that's what I'll say, you know, if there's a need for something like if, uh, you know, uh -huh. if, if you get, if you get fractured in your face and they have to do a rhinoplasty on you to rebuild your face, that's one thing. That's a vital thing. But if you're like, oh, my nose is too big. I don't want to look bad on my senior prom pictures. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sorry. You need to wait till you're 18 to make that decision, uh, because it is, okay. you know, maybe not being made with a fully developed brain at that point. Okay, I kind of get it. I don't. There's like, there's people that are religious that won't treat their kids with chemotherapy, and that that is and odd. Die. Or and then, so like, should the government tell them? I just think it creates a slippery slope, and maybe I'm not thinking about it cohesively or correctly. 
But every time I think about the government stopping a parent from doing something, I think, were they going to tell them we're going to violate your religion and you have to give them chemo or you got to give them a vaccine, but you just kind of look at it as basically a set of rights for the child that are reserved for them when they're. Yeah. I think it's less about not allowing the parent and more allowing that person to make a decision as a fully informed adult instead. So instead of disallowing a parent, it's actually waiting to allow that child to become an adult and make the decision. Okay. Okay. You were buzzing right through these. Got to love libertarians. They get right down to it. There's no, there's no spin zone going around. You the know, we've, we've answered a lot of these, a bunch of these debates and stuff. So I've gotten really good at hitting the 90 second or two minute mark <laughs> because otherwise they start like throwing flags at you or, or hitting buzzers and things like this. So, you know, uh, I, we, I guess maybe it's because we've, we've done some, you know, I think you've got it. Oh down. yeah. I think me and the other libertarians have probably done 20 or 25 debates at this point. So, uh, Oh my gosh. Do you get bored? Does this ever get old? Sometimes it does, but you know, we are pretty good at tossing up different questions or changing up formats. And so uh, as long as they can keep it shaken, you know, that that's always fun, but uh, no, actually I love this. I love running for office. It's been a, it's truly been like a life changing experience and kind of a joy to do. It's uh, something I've always wanted to do is uh, run for office. Now I've gotten to do it. This is my third time uh, running for, for office. So I better like doing it. Otherwise, why do I keep doing it? Yeah, there's something wrong with you <laughs> if you're doing it. A little... um, okay. Well, hopefully you've not been asked this one. In the last year, we had two major and likely preventable disasters, the Maui fire and East Palestine train derailment. Both catastrophes have triggered Americans' distrust in government and brought about a lot of conspiracy theories. Was something nefarious going on in either of those instances? And what would be a libertarian's disaster response? Well, you know, I have, uh, you know, I don't know if I've seen proof of nefarious stuff. Uh, you know, I think it is, uh, particularly East Palestine, I think it is a result of just trying to move too much freight at one time, uh, which is what we're seeing with our trains these days. They get longer and longer. They have less people to oversee them. Um, I don't think like that's, you know, federal regulation can kind of change those standards a little bit. But ultimately, I think it needs to come from uh, really the best thing we can do is deregulate the Jones Act and the Jones Act so that maritime movement of goods uh, happens more. The safest way to move something, by the way, is by, by ship. Uh, ships rarely sink. Uh, they have a pretty good delivery rate and they move quite fast. Um, but we have this thing called the Jones Act that prevents you from moving goods from one American port to another American port unless it's on an American built flagged and crewed ship, which uh, there's not a lot of those because it's expensive and they're tiny and they're dirty. And so they cost a lot. So uh, this is why it costs less to move cargo from Savannah, Georgia to Spain than it does from Savannah, Georgia to San Juan, Puerto Rico uh, because of the Jones Act. So this is why the Mississippi River is not used as a major maritime trade corridor the way it could be uh, if we can allow for container ships to go up and down the Mississippi. Same with uh, chemicals natural gas, oil. Um, it's okay to use trains for these things, but we have to recognize that just trains by their very nature are less safe. Uh, so there's definite ways we could have deregulated the transportation of uh, goods to make it more safe, namely having maritime trade as an alternative. Uh, but yeah, as somebody who, like I worked in the industry for a long time uh, and I would like to see a uh, greater responsibility taken by these rail lines. Another thing that I would say is I, I fully rem support removing tort caps for polluters. Uh, so when a community takes a polluter to court, say Norfolk Southern Rail, uh, who irresponsibly had a bunch of dangerous goods being transported in a way that was unsafe, uh, they should be able to take them to court and a jury of their peers should be able to award, not just a slap on the wrist, but a full-throated punch in the gut in terms of a judgment. Because when that happens, that's what forces these firms to, uh, to actually pay more attention to the safety uh, of the goods they're moving. So these are things we can do without insisting on further government regulation, further central planning that can actually lower the instance of what we saw in East Palestine, lower the, the likelihood of these, uh, of these disasters. And when they happen, make the, make the people responsible actually pay, not just with a, a limited tort that has a ceiling, that's a slap on the wrist to an industry, make it hurt. Uh, community, make it hurt when they pollute in your neighborhood because they'll stop doing it if you do. Uh, and as far as the Maui fire, 
you know, I don't know if that was, I don't believe, you know, nefarious, but I do see that there's going to be a major transfer of wealth from the native people to people who are going to be investing in the land as it's rebuilt. And that's sad. Uh, I think private organizations need to bound together to secure land for those who are indigenous to the land. Um, uh, it, Hawaii, we have to remember, Hawaii was like a colonized place. We, we took that island from a whole community of people. Um, and they still, <clears throat> unfortunately, are suffering from that. And I think this is what we're seeing in Maui is tragically, in the wake of this fire, we're going to see a lot more uh, people from the lower 48 and buying up land and uh, taking it from those who are native. And that's, and that's sad. And it's tragic. And uh, I don't know if there's just a government solution to that can't just say, well, you can't buy this and only people can buy that. Um, but I don't believe it was a nefarious conspiracy. I just think it's a tragic side effect of that fire. Yeah, I think part of it is uh, he doesn't want to have egg on his face. He doesn't want to have a big ecological disaster you know he doesn't have a bp oil spill level thing going on uh as the election happens so they're hoping to not talk about it too much so that it doesn't get brought up a bunch uh i don't think trump's going to bring it up a bunch because if he did the first question people are going to say is well what would you have done differently you were president for four years you didn't change anything about the rail industry you had nothing to do with it uh and so you know someone could argue that if trump were re-elected that accident would have happened under trump too you know uh, I also think part of the reason why they don't want to talk about it is because it puts egg on the face of Pete Buttigieg. I think the Democratic Party is uh, trying to plan to make him a big face in the future, um, possibly in 28. And they don't want to stain his legacy with this. So they're trying to just sweep things under the rug. Uh, if this were a Republican administration and this had happened, the, the eco left would have been freaking out and it would have been the number one issue. But because it's their guy... <clears throat> They don't talk about it too much. Same way like the Obama war machine. Obama was going to war just like George Bush was, but magically the anti-war left forgot to mention that. This one I hope you have an answer for. Rectum Ald was stumped. He said he just passed on it. An electromagnetic pulse attack or an EMP would permanently destroy all electronics in this country. Estimates suggest that within a year, about 90% of the population would perish. As we get into fights abroad, like in Russia and Ukraine and with Israel, you know, the threat is becoming more and more imminent. How would you prepare for an EMP? And then how would you put America back together after one without invoking martial law and just making it all out police? Well, state? I do think the thing that keeps an EMP from happening to us is the fact that we can do it to someone else. So uh, there's that mutually assured destruction okay. that I think uh, hopefully keeps it not happening, right? Uh, but if that unlikely okay. <laughs> event were to occur, um, the, the first thing that's going to happen is, is basically they carved out a city underground, uh, not to get all the history channel on it, but they from do a have nuclear blast. and things like this. After for you go through the security, it, you walk in and it's basically an underground tunnel attack or an EMP attack. Uh, eventually there's a blast whatever door that was three and, three and a half foot thick that weighed 30 tons. Uh, you go through like an uh, airlock and, and they had two of those doors uh, and then society you walk another uh, society, half a mile, a, a half mile deeper itself. into the mountain so is no the bunker itself. And you're going past five buildings. Those represent the five rings of the Pentagon. And each of those buildings are three stories tall and they probably have 50 to 80 offices per floor. The buildings are mounted on springs to survive the shock waves from a nuclear you have to blast. Redraft the laws There's a common a cafeteria capable of serving 3,000 people three meals a day for 30 days on lockdown. They had a barber shop in there with one chair. It's got massive reservoirs, generators, even a crematorium if needed, post office, medical facilities, and emergency command and communication links to the U.S. military all around the world. And so those are really the As big part of the White House team, Camel had access to the most need. restricted part of the bunker. Uh, and then you need uh, uh, some system to educate the presidential the suite. Uh, the presidential so suite was a very secure area. Of civilization, the were, other people in the we site, they had no attack. access. And uh, they were that very... would be where we'd have to kind of get started. Uh, now that you've got me thinking of EMP attacks, it just makes me think of the book uh, The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. It's a Batman book, and they get hit with an EMP attack, and Batman hops on a horse and uh and saves gotham city on horseback <laughs> well me personally i would have my gun and i would find myself a piece of land and start growing food for myself 
Okay, let's move on to pardons. You would have that power as president. Would you pardon Julian Assange, Ross Albright, Edward Snowden, and then Donald Trump if he were found guilty criminally on day one? The first three would be the first thing that I would do. In fact, uh, upon taking office, I would literally take the oath, walk to the microphone, say these th those three, and Leonard Peltier, the Native American activist, are all pardoned. And uh, make note that if you're in federal prison for a crime to which there was no victim, your pardon is coming as soon as your name comes across my desk. And so I would signal immediately that we would start emptying the prisons of those who shouldn't be there. And certainly uh, people who have great, I mean, Ross Ulbricht was sentenced for building a website to which people bought illegal things. You can buy and sell drugs on Facebook right now, but Mark Zuckerberg isn't going to jail. Uh, you know, you have uh, Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, truth tellers, whistleblowers, the people who are really exposing the deep state. By the way, if you think Donald Trump is going to stop the deep state, he didn't pardon Snowden or Assange, the two greatest exposers of what the deep state did uh, in our lifetime, in addition to Chelsea Manning. So if you're putting your hopes on ending the deep state and stopping the crimes that are happening from our warfare state, uh, on Donald Trump, you're sorely mistaken and you need to consider voting for a libertarian who would actually pardon these men uh, who have been truth tellers, people who need to be, you know, uh, while I don't support the public, the public funding of a statue, you know, if someone privately funded a statue of Edward Snowden giving the finger to, this, to the NSA, uh, I, would, I would contribute to that GoFundMe immediately. You mentioned the deep state. I want to touch on that a little bit. What is it? Who is it specifically? How would you define that? Well, to me, the deep state uh, is defined as like this giant federal bureaucracy that exists. It's an unelected group of people. It is made up of many departments and departments, sub departments. And, you know, it's the paper pushers of our government who really a lot of times due to the strength of our executive branch have oh, uh, over, you know, they, they have uh, they have power that outwields their position. And they have the ability to change a lot of things to which, you know, really should be in the realms of a legislature or, or elected representatives. Um, but because of the way our government has been maintained, uh, particularly since World War II, it has just grown and grown and grown. That isn't to say that every federal employee is some sort of terrible, nefarious person who's like conspiring to destroy the country. Most of them just think they're doing their job. They just think, eh, I'm just doing the job that was hired of me. I'm just trying to put money on the, ta you know, food on the table for the kids and get my paycheck. But they're a part of a system that itself is just corrupted. And, and, and it's this unelected bodies that just are in charge of so much of what we do from a day to day basis without any real oversight. And so as president, if I'm elected, I'm going to reduce that. Obviously, I'm going to be chopping down the state piece by piece, like tearing it down brick by brick. And with that, it's going to come with a lot of firings and a lot of departments that no longer exist. And a lot of this will just naturally fade away. But whatever remains uh, needs to be immediately more transparent than it is today. And a lot of what they do really needs to be under the auspices of Congress to approve and to decide upon via legislation, not through executive fiat. And so I really do want to tear down the deep state. It's not just because the deep state doesn't like me or that, you know, I, you know, I want to do what I want to do. I want to put all my family members in charge of things and just, you know, I want to rule like a dictator. Oh, I love Orban and Kim, Kim, you know, Jong-il and, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, like Kim Jong-un and all oh, these, oh, I just wish I could be a dictator like them. No, I actually want to relinquish the power of the state so that me as president has less power. And I think any libertarian worth their salt should be able to make you at least one promise that they get elected president, that the office of president will be a weaker office when they leave than when they got in there. How much would you shrink the government? Would you do it? Ramaswamy, you said, you know, we'll go by their social security numbers and get rid of half. Would you go more extreme than that? Well, ideally, you know, I'm a minarchist. So like if I could wave a magic wand, our government would consist of the military to protect us from invasion, courts to adjudicate disputes between people and law enforcement to actually carry those things out. And so if I were president, you know, our government would fit in the palm of our hand. You know, it would be smaller than even what the, we had at our founding. You know, I don't think we need uh, everything that, you know, all the controls federally that, that were granted via the Constitution. Like, I, I, like ideally... Um, but at least could we just get back to the constitution? Like if we could just get back to the constitution, I would be a much happier camper than I am today. Uh, and I'll even be more of an optimist than I already am. But, you know, until we get there, like, it's not even worth talking about, like reducing it to minarchy or anarchy at that point, which is why I tell anarchists, you know, 
even though I'm not one, hey, we're on the same team, buddy, until we got a whole lot of state to chop down before we're like at odds with each other. Because uh, right now it's the exact opposite of what we both want. What do you think about the border crisis? Is there one and how would you fix it? Yes, there is a border crisis, but it's not caused by immigrants. It's caused by our government's inability to process people and get them through the border quickly. Um, I support Ellis Island style of immigration. If you're a peaceful person, you should be able to come through a port of entry, declare who you are, go through a simple background check that could take a few hours in the 21st century. And as long as you're not wanted for a crime that requires extradition, you should be able to come right in and get to work. Go find your job, go get to work. And if you don't find jobs, uh, well, then come on right back through. You should be able to easily come back through. Uh, I think this does two things. One, oh, and if you are flagged for a crime that with a nation that requires extradition, you can then say, I'm a political refugee. It's a BS what they're doing. I claim asylum. Then you work through the asylum claim. Right now, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who come across the border, they claim asylum. And now we have to go through this process. But if we allowed for this Ellis Island model, they would just move very freely through. Uh, this would also help with seasonal employment, you know, farming, uh, agricultural labor. They could come up during planting and harvest and then go back home after uh, instead of being trapped here in the United States. This would reduce the impact of welfare on many of these agricultural workers who they come here, they send most of their money home, they stay here because they can't go back, and then they rely on welfare of the local systems to take care of them. And so this would actually reduce that welfare impact. And a reminder to all, immigrants create jobs, they create businesses, they grow the economic pie. 55% uh, of American businesses, Fortune 500 companies worth a billion dollars or more are headed by an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. So these are people who are like creating large scale in terms of employment, jobs, prosperity, they grow the economic pie. And we need jobs now. We have way too many people retiring and not enough people coming in to fill that labor gap up. And if we don't want to have a decade of stagnation like Japan did in the 80s and 90s, we need to recognize this now and understand we need immigrant labor. We need them. They need jobs. Let's make this easy. So just everybody that came through already leave? Keep no, them I, out? Let them I think those who are like here them. already should be able to go through a quick process of being pro uh, processed. They should be able to go, you know, ideally okay. instead of having to go all the way back to a port of entry, I would say, you know, just say, Hey, throw a bilingual person at every uh, post office in America and say, hey, if you're already here, you have 365 days to get to a post office, declare yourself, do a background check, and you're okay. good. If you haven't done that, at that point, we're going to extradite you back to your home nation because we gave you every opportunity just to peacefully declare who you are so we know who's here. Uh, I think that's a pretty simple way of doing that. And then DACA recipients should immediately, I think, uh, be fast-tracked for citizenship. These are people who came over here with their parents. They... They've known no other nation in the United States many times. Uh, now they're in their 30s. And, you know, uh, why are we saying, you know, why are we even debating sending somebody back to like Guatemala when they came here at two years old and they've been in the United States and they, they have a job and a, you know, a business and a family? Like, it seems to me that's, that's ridiculous. And we could fast track these people to some sort of legal status and then later on to citizenship. And it should be easier to become a citizen. It's highly complicated. I appreciate those who say, we, you know, we've been waiting in line forever. Why should people get ahead? They shouldn't. They shouldn't get ahead. They should be behind you, but we should make the process for getting you through far quicker so we can keep moving these people through. Okay. Kind of a sad issue. I didn't even realize until a few months ago there were libertarians that subscribe to the notion of open borders. It kind of blows my brain that there's some libertarians that think that fits with that ideology. Can you kind of explain that and how how they get well, there from the philosophy and why it's wrong? That it's not well, libertarian, uh, but how do they get to, <laughs> if I'm making any so sense? I think, uh, so I think I'm closer to being fully open borders than closed borders. And I think okay. that philosophically, that's really in line with the idea of free movement of people. It's been in our platform for, forever as a party. But the idea that, you know, peaceful people should be able to freely move so long as they're not harming another person or violating property rights has long been held as like a, a part of libertarian philosophy, you know, um, and, and, and I do, I, I adore my good friend, Jacob Hornberger, who claims that because I believe in a minimal immigration control, that I'm some sort of socialist, because uh, he is a fully open borders guy. But, you know, one of the examples that he uses, you know, when, when he drives from like his home state, uh, Virginia to like, you know, Michigan for a convention, you know, he travels mm -hmm. through several state borders. He is not violating anybody's rights by doing that. He's just peacefully traveling and not harming anybody. And he 
believes that national borders should be the same way, that if you're not harming anybody, you should be able to peacefully come here and, and be part of commerce, the marketplace. And I believe that we should minimally uh, invade upon that. Like, I think the free market would dictate that if I'm an individual, I can mm -hmm. produce labor and labor is capital. And we as libertarians believe in the free movement of labor and capital across borders in terms of a free marketplace. And so, okay. well, I don't believe citizenship should be just be, hey, you came over here, you're instantly a citizen, go vote. I do believe that if you're like, hey, you're a farm worker, we have farms that need labor, go work on that farm, go make that farmer money, go make yourself money, go prosper, both of you. That works out better. Okay. When it comes to crime, the right would make you think if you walk outside, you're going to get murdered. The left just kind of ignores it, want to get rid of the police, defund the police. Where do you fall on the spectrum? And then how do you address crime? so that it's not a police state. Like well, it's as I, bad as the right says. Yeah, I, crime exists, right? You know, and uh, it's not something to ignore. I think the best way to focus on crimes is or to focus on crimes of actual victims, you know. Uh, and if we remove so many of these victimless crimes from our criminal code, we, you know, we have more time for police and law enforcement to actually focus on those crimes with victims. You know, there's only so many policing hours in a day. And so, uh, you know, I think that that is uh, you know, when we remove things like the drug war or sex work that's between consenting adults and other things. Uh, we save up more time to say, go after sex crimes with those who aren't consenting or murders or, or fraud or theft um, where there's actual victims. And so the first way to address crime is to make sure we're addressing the right crime, like actual crime, not okay. crime, you know? Uh, and uh, secondly, we absolutely have to look at the civil rights of each and every individual. You are presumed innocent until you're proven guilty. And so with regards to law enforcement, we need to look at other things that protect people's uh, liberty, like ending the practice of no-knock raids, which have killed a lot of innocent people. Uh, we need to, um, you know, address the way our, we arrest people. Like what happened to George Floyd, I believe was murder, putting someone's knee on your neck. And even if they were, even if they're high on drugs, you should recognize they're high on drugs and still putting a knee on their neck would cause them to asphyxiate. Uh, and then, I do believe we're going to see more responsible policing when we do not overcriminalize society. Like Eric Garner was killed in New York for selling loose cigarettes in New York City. He was choked to death. Well, if not selling, you know, if selling loose cigarettes wasn't seen as a crime that police needed to go per prosecute against, uh, they wouldn't have messed with him and he'd be alive. Well, you know, or at least wouldn't have been killed that day. Uh, and so I think the overcriminalization of our society has led to where police are now frustrated, stressed, you know, they, they, they're trying to do too many things at once and that leads to mistakes being made. Uh, and then I think also there are structural things like ending the practice of no knock raids that could save a lot of lives. Uh, I just always think about in 2015 in Habersham County, Georgia, I think it was 2015. Uh, they did a raid on a house where they threw a flashbang grenade through a window and it landed in a child's crib and severely burned, uh, the child's face, like, uh, an entire half oh, wow. of their face was severely burned because it was next to the, it landed literally on the child, the flashbang grenade. Uh, and so I think about instances like that and go, geez, we have to have a better way of doing it. Homelessness. How would you address that homelessness crisis in the United States as a libertarian? How do you solve that giant problem? Yeah. Um, the first thing we need to do is uh, in the regulations that prevent new homes from being built, large, uh, you know, uh, multi-unit housing from being constructed. These people with their McMansions who are NIMBYs, who say, oh, well, if we build multi-unit multi housing, my property value is going to be affected. Well, what affects your property values worse? Having some townhomes uh, five miles from you or having people sleeping on the streets who are dying? Like, to me, I know what's more attractive to me. Uh, but the next issue is how do we address those who are already suffering from homelessness? I don't believe that happens from a centrally planned state apparatus. I think it's going to come from, again, direct and mutual aid organizations. I've met wonderful people who feed thousands of meals a month to the homeless in their communities uh, or who host clothing drives or school backpack drives to help those who are lower income uh, meet the needs for them or their families. Like this is the kind of help that we could provide to more and more people in our communities if we were stopped being taxed so much by this giant government. If we had more of our own wealth to put back into our communities instead of taken away from Washington D to Washington, D.C., you know, those centrally planned welfare programs, they're inefficient. Uh, my grandpa used to tell me, and I love this, uh, I use it all the time, you know, the government will tax you a dollar and you get back a dime. 
uh, how about instead of taking the money out of our communities, we just leave them here and we're allowed to take care of ourselves better through direct and mutual aid. Because I'll tell you right now, you can do a whole lot more good with an individual trying to help feed the homeless by going down to the store, buying some food, cooking it up and going out there and helping people than devising these complicated food, you know, these algorithms of the state of, oh, well, this person gets a tax break mm -hmm. here, but only if they know about it, only if they know this or this, that and the other and creating all this red tape. We can do a much better job without a welfare state that's centrally planned and trust that we're going to help each other out uh, through through charity and through direct and mutual aid with our with our communities. Do you really think charities will solve it? I don't have a lot of I see a lot of charities waste money too. It just seems, hey, we can avoid some taxes and then people get corrupt and get in there and they don't do it. So when I hear charity will solve the problem, I kind of go, oh yeah. I don't see churches doing it either. Well, just like we can't just rely on the state and say, ah, the state will take care uh -huh. of it. We can't just go, ah, the charities will take care of it. You have to pay attention to who you're giving your money to and make sure that it's going okay. further. But I believe in a world with decentralization and the ability for you to choose who to help and how to help, uh, you're going to get far better results and far more efficiency than you would have just having this centrally planned system that takes the money out of your pocket without you even asking. Uh, and, you know, and then puts that, runs that through the federal bureaucracy ring. Uh, I just think it, it's better served in our own communities. Uh, and, you know, it, it goes further. Just the dollar goes further when it's in the hands of individuals okay. as opposed to that central planning. So you're right. There are bad charities out there. There certainly are. You need to pay attention to where you give your money. And I think part of what makes that even more viable in the 21st century is the instant, instant access to information and the ability to be super connected. So when like if there's a shady charity going on, it's very quick for somebody to throw up a Facebook page or, you know, start tweeting about it and getting people notified about what's going on. Uh, certainly more than it used to be. Last question. We made it all the way to the end. So you've made a lot of promises throughout all this, but candidates always do that. Trump was going to build a wall. Obama was going to close Guantanamo Bay. None of this happened. Obamacare was going to get repealed. That didn't happen either. What makes people think when they vote for you, you're going to actually deliver on everything you promised and not just forget about them once you get in the White House? Well, the first promise that I can make you is that I'm not going to get everything that I promise you. That that part of being okay. president is going to have to recognize that nothing is perfection. Uh, but what I can do is I can constantly keep the eye on the ball of reducing the size and the scope of the state. And you know, because of how giant, abusive, and intrusive the state is, uh, you know, it's very easy to keep our eye on that ball because there's just a lot to chop away at. And so I could spend, I could spend every single day of my first and second term cutting government, like finding things to cut, finding things to remove, you know, and I still won't get to the ideal. And so, uh, I recognize this and recognize this from the very beginning keeps me honest about, you know, I'm, I am giving you what the best picture could be, but understand that, uh, the world isn't perfect. And I'm going to make it as, as I'm going to do as good as I can. Um, but I think what makes libertarians different is uh, we don't blow with the political winds either. We've been basically set in our principles for 50 years. We've been saying what we're going to do for 50 years. I think there's so much backing us in terms of like the rhetoric and the years and the years and the years that we would be so reticent to step back <laughs> and try to backslide <laughs> because we just know we would never hear the end of it. Uh, because of how much we've been saying, no, we have to do it this way. Uh, and so short of being proven completely wrong that all these concepts that I have are complete failures, uh, I'm going to fight for them and I'm not going to be apologetic about it. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Thanks for coming on. Do you have any closing remarks or tell people where they can find you online or how to support your campaign if they like? What oh, they yeah, want? absolutely. Well, if you want to join the campaign, we already have hundreds of volunteers and donors in all 50 states. But if you want to join this movement, this group of people who want to bring the message of liberty to the millions of disaffected people and bring them into our tent and grow our party, uh, first and foremost, go to votechaseoliver.com and join the campaign. We also want you to join the Libertarian Party. Go to LP.org and join up as a member. We want to double our membership at least in 2024 and hold it for the next four years. And you can be a part of that by going to LP.org. And then, of course, if you're one of those social media folks, find me at Chase for Liberty on all the major platforms. We'd love for a follow, like, comment, subscribe, do all of those things to help grow our algorithm, algorithm reach uh, and prevent the Zuckerbergs from the world from making, uh, from showing people they only have uh, two choices. Let's show them there's more. Now that you know where we've been, 
find out where we're going. Tune in to Ladies Love Politics, where you can stay informed without going insane.